All right, good morning, everybody. No timer. There's no time for a timer. We're just going to get started. I want to start off with uh, some icebreakers, some questions, uh, and then let's make sure we get into some prayer. Uh, it's really important. <laughs> uh, but we've got some friends and some family who are out of town. We've got actually a family up in uh, Uganda. They traveled north. Um, I don't know where. <laughs> I don't know where they are in Uganda uh, exactly, but they are in Uganda and hopefully bringing back a report for us. Do you guys know when they return? Dan and Rebecca? No idea. Okay. Um, but I'm excited to hear about the ministry that's going on over there. Um, so I want to pray for them. But all right, so the icebreaker. Good morning, guys. Would somebody tell me the best thing that has happened in your week this past week? What's the best thing that happened? You came home, yes. I, I thought they would have jumped up right away. My daughter's home, you know. Or you were in the process of jumping up. It just, it's a little slower. <laughs> it's good to see you. Exactly. We are too, Vitus. So glad. Glad to be home. All right, anybody else? What's the best thing that's happened in your week this week? I had an anniversary. Callie did too. Uh, yeah, it was a great time. Um, we actually have a friend uh, that shared, actually, I think a couple friends who share the same anniversary and just called them to wish them anniversary and had a great time catching up with them. And um, a couple students actually that have gone through here and graduated seminary and are now uh, off. So, uh, anybody else? Yeah. Um, and so I was praying a lot about it over the weekend before um, and just during that time. And the first two went way better than expected, and I was praising God for it. And then the third one went worse than I was expecting. Okay. <laughs> and I was praising God for that too. Nice. Yeah. I also got to play airsoft yesterday with you. You got to play airsoft yesterday too. And you're okay? I, I, before like airsoft really got out, I guess popular, or maybe it was around, I didn't know about it, we would just go around playing BB gun. <laughs> we would shoot each other with BB guns. And I remember one time I was, I was uh, charging, you know, in an encampment. They were, you know, they were bunkered down and it's single shot, you know, so I'm charging with a single shot. That was, that was dumb because there was more than one person back there. But I come around and they both just like maybe were startled. They reacted and shot me. One got me right here. One got me right here. And I'm like, I'm bleeding. So I go inside, I get cleaned up. I'm like, guys, I'm done. Um, the next day in school, I'm like, man, I'm like, it's still swollen. Like, oh, and I was like, wait a minute. There's something in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom, that's when I had to tell her what happened. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I tried to keep that, that bit from her. Uh, she took me, you know, to the doctor somewhere to get, to get it out. And she would not allow them to give me any kind of pain uh, hell, because they had to cut it and push it out. She was like, he'll learn. <laughs> yeah, I love mom. <laughs> and you guys get to meet her. Oh, she's, they're coming out uh, Tuesday. Uh, my family's coming out. I'm excited to, to see them, my grandmother. Uh, now, next week, we're going to be traveling, um, my parents uh, and the girls. We're going to be going out to North Carolina, uh, Willard, near Wallace, about an hour... We are going to be staying in Wallace, Lord willing, uh, and see my grandfather's grave, and then heading down to Wilmington, uh, and we're going to be getting some seafood. There's a place I think we're really excited to go to, uh, something fishy, if you've ever heard of it. We will be there next weekend. Right on. Yeah. Is it good? Oh, Okay. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, yeah, pray for us as we travel. Uh, Callie's unfortunately is going to be staying. We've got a, a, a puppy that might be giving birth. Uh, and then my grandmother, uh, who wants obviously to see her, her, her husband, uh, in his grave, uh, won't be making it. She'll be staying here with Callie. Um, so 
All right, so the anniversary technically is my best thing this week, but I had some moments with the Lord this week, just just driving to work, listening to worship music. I was telling just, uh, just I almost had to pull over, just like the Lord was just like, I, I was like, I can't drive in and, and, and like sing and clap, Lord. Like I really, you know. Uh, so yeah, I had some, some great moments like that. All right, so next question. What is the worst thing that happened this week? Anybody? You're going back to work. Okay, go ahead. You do. Okay. How do you feel? All right, on. Good, good. He, they donated. He donated blood. How, how did they get it out? I thought you were like, like a brick wall. It, it was. Oh no! Right, all right. <laughs> Anybody else? Worst thing? Anybody who's joining us live, go ahead and type it up. What's the best thing? What's the worst thing that has happened uh, this week? So was it, no, was it last week or was it the week before? Where this opportunities to talk about God's faithfulness. So years ago, and this is like, and I was just, this is, this is a week old, but I'm going to share with you guys what I wanted to say, but I just, I couldn't. I couldn't speak. Um, Years ago, just seeking the Lord, I remember exactly where we were. I had had a Starbucks, just just praying, um, just praying for the Lord and praying for that community. And the Lord just gave me a word. It was just like an impression that has really just been my life word ever since. This is even before Callie and I were married. It's been a word that I I draw on, and, and I thought it was a calling, like he was telling me, faithful. That, that's the word, faithful. And I've always kind of looked at that, you know, where like, that's the word he's told me, like, like, I have to be faithful, like, I need to be faithful. And then I've drawn strength on that at times to, to keep going, you know, like, like, Lord gave me that word, be faithful. And it like, literally last week just flipped on me, and it has nothing to do with me being faithful but him. And all the times that I feel like maybe I have been faithful or I've been able to dig deep and draw strength to continue, I mean, just in that moment, it was like him telling me, no, I'm faithful. Oh, man, I was so wrecked last week, and it's been so good. Yeah, um, God is faithful, and he is faithful to show up and draw near. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to just draw near to God. There's so many other places and things we could be doing this morning. But thank God we're not doing those things. We're not in those places. But we're here, and, we're, and we've set aside this time to seek God and to hear from Him and to encourage other people who would love to do the same thing. So, guys, we're gonna, I'm going to pray. We're going to pray for those who, who are gone. We're going to pray for us. And then we're going to sing some songs. And I want, I just, again, just think about these words really meditate on these words. If you can't, sing them from the heart and then just just pray them and say, Lord, help me sing these from the heart. Uh, And then we're going to get into God's word. That's that's our plan this morning. So musicians, come on up uh, and then I'm going to pray. Father God, we love you and we want more of you. Lord, our life is just chaotic. Maybe at best busy and Lord, we're frail and there's things going on. We're not sure how to, how to handle them, how to th- even think about them at times. Lord, over and over and over, I'm reminded that I have nothing in myself. I have no wisdom, um, nothing to offer the world, nothing to offer my family. Lord, everything is from you. And I ask God that you would, and all of us, lead us to, to some degree, feel this way as well. And then come to you asking for help. You are God in heaven and we are here on earth. Let our words be few. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear, to receive your words. Change us to be more like you. Or we come to you hungry and eager to hear from you and to draw near. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. So you remember that one time when Rebecca was up here and, and she got y'all to clap like for a whole song? <clears throat> Does anybody remember that? I 
That's all I'm saying. When it comes time. You stand. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else how I need you. Oh.
Thank you, guys. Can you guys sing that song afterwards? I may ask you then. So, and, and someone hit the lights for us. We're going to get into 1 John. We're going to start off in chapter 2 and then, and then head into chapter 3. But I wanted to share, uh, our, my family had a, a reunion years ago. I don't think, Callie, you weren't even in the picture. It was years ago out in San Diego. It was at a resort out there. And there's lots of them. I had never been to this one. Okay, she was. She was there. I remember, though, uh, coming to this resort that we had never been, getting out of the parking lot or out of the car in the parking lot and really just wondering, where do we go? Looking around, not sure. Back then, I don't think we, we, had, we weren't texting as much as we were. We weren't, probably didn't have a smartphone, couldn't look it up. But I noticed a, a, a man that looked like my grandfather. And so I thought, well, let's, let's follow him. Let's see where he leads us. And as we start following this man, I start seeing... More and more people that looked like my grandfather. My grandfather had 15, maybe 16 siblings. So we got there, you can see more and more people, it's like they're multiplying. I got tons of, of, of people that look like my grandfather, and I was able to really just follow the family resemblance. John uses that same imagery. He's going to start talking about that, and he actually breaks people into two categories. Say there are those who are the the children of God, and then he actually uses kind of a phrase, those who are the children of the devil. And he makes a strong case that you actually will look like who you belong to. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. Guys, again, turn with me. We're going to be in chapter three, but really the best way to understand John's letter, just like any other passage of, uh, uh, or, or book or letter in scripture is to not get so caught up with chapters and verses. I mean, we use them, they're helpful, but a lot of times, I mean, they weren't written that way. They were, it was a letter, there was a train of thought, and sometimes the chapters can stop that, and you really start trying to pick it up, and, and then you can take things out of context. So let's not get too caught up in that. I want to pick up in verse 29, this is where we, we ended last week, and it's really a, a hinge verse into this next point. So he says, in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who also practices righteousness is born of him. So he's saying that if you're, if you're born of him, if you're born of God, if you're a child of God, if he's your, your parent, then you're going to look like him. You're going to resemble him. And that launches us into chapter 3, verse 1. It says right here, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Anybody ever f- familiar with this passage? Is this what, there's songs about this one. I mean, really, really, just a quick show of hands. How many of you guys have this memorized? You guys are being shy. I know more of you guys. The NSB, the, what I just read, uses the word see. How many of you guys have in your translation, behold? You guys have it with you? All right. Everybody get your Bibles. Everybody hold your Bibles in the air. Everybody say word. All right, we need, we need some help. Uh, phones are okay. So, behold is, is in a lot of translations, and I like that better. I think C is too mild. This word is, is supposed to be really, really expressive. It's, 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 he's, he's in awe at the magnificent love of God. He, he is, like, shocked by it. This, this phrase, how great a love I think it's interesting because it actually is, is kind of, I think it can be translated when originally it was more like, what country is this from? Like, like, where does this come from? This is foreign. This is not normal. What, what, where does this come from? And then it kind of took on, you know, like I said, that phrase and, and went on from there. One of the ways to really capture this is to look where it's used in the Gospels. You guys remember the story when Jesus, uh, there was with his disciples they're on, on the boat, these professional fishermen, and this crazy storm comes, and they're afraid they're going to die. 
They're on a boat. This is where they, they work. They're professional boatmen. <laughs> and and they're, 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 they're petrified. They think, we, we are surely going to perish. And then Jesus gets up, and what he does, remember what he does? He, he rebukes the storm, and instantly it's calm. Do you remember their reaction? They were like, who is this man that, that the wind, you know, that the weather obeys him? Who is this man? Like, this is crazy. Uh, this is the same phrase. Where does he come from? What country is he from? Really, what planet? I mean, this is not normal. So this is the kind of, like, really the expression that John is using. Where does this kind of love come from? This is not normal. This is amazing. Guys, are you in awe? Think about the songs. I asked you guys to think about the words that we were singing, that we are a child of God. Does that trip you out? I mean, does that put any kind of sense of awe in you, that you're a child of God? If not, then maybe the truth is, maybe you just don't understand how amazing that is. Or, I think it may be worse, you just don't believe it. You don't believe it. Now think of it. At, at one time, every single one of us in here was an enemy to God. Scripture uses words like we were at enmity. I mean, we were enemies of God. We were rebellious. We, professing to be wise, became fools. We, we said, God, we know better. We, we, we do what we want to do. And so we were at, at at odds with God. We were enemies with God in rebellion against the eternal king, facing his wrath, his eternal just wrath. But then at, at, at a time, God acted. He reached down and he took care of, he, he took the punishment and the wrath upon himself so that we not only uh, could escape hell, but that we could be his children. He went out to the rebellious people and, and paid for their crimes, but not only just to send them on their way, but to then invite them in. The rebellious invited in as, as heirs, as citizens, as, as children, royal priesthood. That's crazy. Who does that? What kind of love is that? That's not normal. And so, so it's almost like, like John is expecting us to say, no way. And he follows it. It says, and such we are. He says right here, no way. It's absolutely true. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. I think we can accept the fact that the world around us does not see us as maybe children of God. I mean, the world around us, they don't understand what has happened to us eternally, positionally. And so I think it's because, it says, because it did not know him. Think about this. I'm going to guess that there's not a single one of us in this room that sometime in this past week, somebody just maybe at work or just kind of looked over and were like, whoa. That man's a child of God. How many of you guys had that happen to you? Did anybody just maybe saw you in the workplace, saw you at Walmart, and, and just unmistakably called you for what you are? They must be children of God. That person right there, yeah, yeah, looks just like them. Family resemblance. Does that happen to anybody? I'm guessing not. But I think it's part of the reason, though, is because they don't know God. How could they say that they, you look just like him if they don't know him themselves? I think that's part of it. They don't understand. I mean, there are some people who knew him. But when it says, you know, uh, how could they possibly know us if they didn't know him? I think that's talking about when Jesus came to earth. They, they, some of them understood who he was, some of them followed some of the people, but generally most of them didn't understand this is, this is God in the flesh, the creator of the universe having supper with us. A lot of them didn't understand just the, 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 the magnitude of who Jesus was. They knew he was special, but they didn't know that. They, didn't, they really didn't know that, that God of the universe was having a, a conversation with them. 
right in front of them. And so if they don't really know him, how can they really know us? I think that's what he's saying. And then he goes on in verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. This is remarkable. I mean, this, this is one of these passages this morning. Uh, and as, as my preparation, and, I'm, and as you guys study this and read this with me, I hope it really does just floor you. This is remarkable. He just said that the world does not see us as his children. Okay, we get it. They don't understand what has happened to us. Not yet. We look just like them. Probably work and, and act similar to them. But one of the problems is that the world doesn't see us that way. And, and sometimes we don't see ourselves that way either. To be honest, it, it just doesn't wow us anymore. We just, don't, we just don't see ourselves that way. We lose sight of just how magnificent this is. How magnificent. And it, we are called children of God. And so what he's saying, we are children of God. And it has not yet appeared what we will yet be. The language of the New Testament for salvation is, is always like a radical language. It's, it's, it reflects someone who has not just received a ticket to a place, but this, the, the, the language for, for salvation in the New Testament, everything, it's just... This radical change has happened in their lives. They were born of God. Remember, John is the one who used the language in his Gospels. You've been born again. There's been such a radical change in you. The only way that we can describe it is that you've been born anew. You didn't just get your, desti- your eternal destination changed. You've been turned inside out. That word metamorphosis. You've been transformed from the inside out. This is all radical stuff. We, we have spent length discussing this, but we still just need to be reminded how amazing it truly is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 reminds us that what Jesus did for us was not on the basis of what we did or what we earned. It was on the basis of grace, not of works. It's on the basis of grace. But on the basis of grace, in verse 10, he is making us his masterpiece. You guys remember that verse? We, we love Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9, but don't forget verse 10. It's amazing. So God is making us into a masterpiece, each and every one of us. Just think on this for a little bit. Think about the artist that painted the universe. Think about just that, 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 that glorious screen savior maybe you have or, or whatever, whatever picture. Think about just the beauty and the light of the stars in the universe and just the complexity and just the artwork of galaxies, just how beautiful it is. Think about that. Let, let, let your mind, just see, like the purples and the blues and the light coming through, just gorgeous. It says that Scripture is saying that that same artist, that same masterpiece that God has done there, He is doing and making us a masterpiece as well. And it's so magnificent. When you hold up, when He holds you up in the heavenlies, Scripture is saying that the angels will gasp and just wonder at what you've become. It will, it, it will, it will, it will stop them in their tracks, the work God has done in us. That's a, are you guys with me on this? That's crazy. Comparing God's work in us to, to the heavens and to the universe, and, and we're more ama- uh, amazing. His work in us is more amazing than, than the whole universe. Amen. That's crazy, yes. Guys, this is cool. This is us. God's work in us. Paul Paul writes to the Corinthians, No eye has seen and no ear has heard how absolutely magnificent you will be. Think about the the most amazing, again, usually it's a screensaver, (laughs) some place that we've never been. It's just gorgeous. Even add in all the Photoshop you can think of to make it even more better. No eye has seen how magnificent we would be. 
we will be. God, God's work is greatly to be praised. And he says, this, this has yet to be revealed. We're seeing glimpses of it. We're feeling it, you know, like, but uh, I'm with you guys. Like, it's, it's kind of hard to accept. I'm like, I just, I just don't get it. I don't know how, I can't be that excited because I don't know how it's going to be. I have, it, it says right here, I haven't seen. But John says this hasn't be, been revealed yet, but it will be. And when will it be revealed? He tells us when, when Jesus appears. When Jesus returns and he comes back and he reveals himself, it will be in that moment. I, I think one of the struggles we have, I, I think this has been true of me, I think uh, probably true of some of you guys, is that we tend to, to lock like, our, our, our picture or our view of Jesus. We, we lock him into uh, how he looked when he was on earth. And we think that's how it's going to be. He's going, to be, he's going to come back, and maybe he'll have a little purple on, but he's pretty much going to be wearing sandals. <laughs> he's going to be coming back, and he's going to be wearing, you know, whatever the, you know, they, they wore back then. But that's not correct. Don't, don't let this, the, the, the humble version of Jesus who came and, and, and humbled himself and came as a servant and took on flesh be your only view of him. What is correct about him is that he is seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. Everybody say glory. glory. Don't say it like a Southern Baptist, like, like glory. No, you don't have to say it like that. That's fine. That's weird. <laughs> I want to say it like that again, glory. But when he says he will return in all of his glory, it, it's so magnificent. That, again, it's beyond anything that we could ever imagine. Read, read Revelation chapter 1 and get this image of Jesus that is just like, even in, in how well they described him in that, you know, with like rushing water, hair white as, as wool, and yet eyes burning, and his countenance like the sun, and yet we can see his eyes like fire, and like swords coming out of his mouth. It just, his speech is so piercing, just amazing view of, of, of him in, in, in his glory. I mean, it, it, his glory is so remarkable. You guys remember when it passed before Moses? Or, or Moses is actually asking him, "Can I let, let me see your glory?" What was his response to Moses? Do you guys remember this? He's like, "No, if you see it, you'll die." It is so transcendent and beyond anything that we have experienced. If you even just see this, you'll die. And so he shielded himself and really let the residual, maybe the, the residual and, and his backside see him. And what happened to Moses after that for the next few days? He glowed, and the people actually had to hide themselves from him. The, guys, this is what I'm talking about, and, and his glory. and this, we, are, we are made and brought into that, and we'll share in that. It is so remarkable. There's a glory that's so unimaginable and magnificent. It says when he reveals himself, every knee will bow. They're not going to think about it. It's just going to be like instant. I, we see him in his glory, and the only... The only suitable response is to bend the knee, bow down, and confess you are God. To... That is the only response available. He is just that magnificent. Can you think about this? The more magnificent your view of Christ is and his glory, the glorified Christ, the more magnificent the concept uh, of just this, this idea or the, the, this, uh, in that moment, we are going to be like him. If that doesn't excite you, again, I think is you just don't really understand how exciting he is <laughs> or you don't believe it. That we are going to be revealed in that moment when he's revealed in all his glory and we're going to be made like him. It's going to be evident to everybody else that we are his children because we're going to look like him. We're going to be like him. That is magnificent beyond I think words can describe. And in that moment, the world will know. And so if that is true, he goes on to verse 3. And everyone who has this hope, so just anytime we use this word hope in Scripture, it's not like, well, I hope it doesn't rain today, you know, or I hope it, you know, the weather holds up. I got a mow today. You know, it's like, like this, this chance that it might not. It's always a guarantee. It's always a hope that I, I have confidence in and I can look forward to. That's my, that's my hope. That's what I look forward to, to guarantee. And so he says, everyone who, who has this hope or, or this guarantee fixed on him, meaning Jesus, says, purifies himself 
just as he is pure. In other words, if, if, if this is true, then we should live like it. It, it should be evident in our lives that, that we are children of God. And that sets up the, the discussion that we're about to have. Verse 4 through 10, guys, is, is critical to understand. It's one of these texts that, that has high potential for, for misunderstanding. It's one of these texts where um, really like, like you, you got to give extra attention to. For most of the Bible, cover to cover, I mean, just with basic Bible study principles, and, and those are needed. Everybody needs to have something. But most of the time, you can just read Scripture, you can read it in the English, and you can fully understand the intent of the author. It's not hard to, to see. It's not hard to, to discover. And sometimes the original language, we go to the Greek, all that really does some, is maybe just fill in some of the blanks or, or pad it a little bit more to help us understand better. But for the most part, uh, just the, the, the English translations and Bibles are, are magnificent. They're great. They're reliable. There are a few passages, though, that are difficult to understand. There tends to be these passages that are maybe like that, that word is only used once uh, in the New Testament, so it's hard to like see, well, how do they use it over there to understand it? This is one of those texts, and it, if we don't understand some of the nuances of the Greek, or we don't even just have a resource that we can turn to to understand the, the, the nuances, it can be misleading. So guys, I really want to to take a moment, what you think you know about this passage, and just kind of put it on hold, and let, let's, let's go through this. Verse 4 says, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. When he's talking about sin and lawlessness, he's using a verb tense called the durative present. Everybody say durative present, please. So, so the best way to think about that is, is the duration, durative and duration. Uh, it, it, it's think about it like it's reflecting, it's something that, that happens over a period of time. In other words, it's a lifestyle of sin. That's literally what he's talking about, a lifestyle of sin. It, it, it's a way of life that where you habitually sin. The verb tense indicates that. So he's talking about sin and he's talking about lawlessness. Now these terms are very similar and originally they, they were used interchangeably. But the false teachers, the, the, uh, the Gnostics at that time who he's writing to, had started to redefine these terms and make them distinct. They were interchangeable. They started to separate them and differentiate. So these false teachers had created this new theology this, this idea, and they were teaching um, this new theology that really was just to fit their morality. It was to fit the way they wanted to live. And basically, their theology was this. We haven't actually covered this part, but this is what they were teaching, and this is what they believed, that the, the immaterial and the material were, were, are, are different, or they're separated. So that was in the spirit and then that was in the flesh or, or the body, completely separate. The spirit part connects to God, and the material part is completely disconnected from God, cannot be connected to God. And that's why, again, I think last week we said that's why they rejected Jesus, because there's no way God could come and take on flesh. And so whatever I do, though, whatever they did in the material or in the flesh, in the body, it, it was irrelevant to their relationship with God, because it's the spirit that connected the flesh, it's on his own. So with this theology, they had created a way where they could live immoral lives, they could do whatever they wanted, and still believe they're fine with God. That's kind of the essence, and, and John is challenging that. They, they, they took this word lawlessness, and they defined it as rebellion against God. Sometimes this word is used to describe maybe Satan's rebellion. And so it's fighting against God. It's at war against God. It's to rebel against God. And they're saying that's bad. Yeah, that's bad. Rebelling against God is bad, but we would never do that. That's not us. I would, I would never, you know, we're for God. You know, I, I know the right things to say. I would never, I would never go against God, but our, you know, because our spirits are connected. We would never be guilty of rebellion against God. 
So they deny the concept of sin. Now that sounds crazy, right? Who would do that? Don't a lot of us do that? All the time? You just didn't put it into some fancy theology, but it's the way you live. Oh, I can sin. I can do all this over and over and over and over, but I haven't, I haven't turned away from God. I have not rebelling against God. I still, I still choose Him and associate and identify with Him. But you sin over and over. It's, it's, it's habitual. So they deny the concept of sin. We actually dealt with this in chapter 1. John said, if you say that you have no sin, you are a liar. In the same teaching, this is what he's dealing with. These false teachers were saying, we have no sin. We don't buy into that concept. And now they're saying, you know, we would never rebel against God. We don't buy, but we don't buy into this sin thing. So John is responding. And when he says, everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness because sin is lawlessness. When he says sin, he's saying sin is a rebellion. When I sin, I am actually fighting against God. When I sin, I am aligning myself with the enemy. When I go on and I choose to disobey God, I am rebelling against God. I'm fighting against Him. I, be, I am aligning myself with His enemies. That's what it's saying in its essence. So he's saying that there's no such distinction. That's bogus. That's whack theology. When you sin, you are at war with God. What's the worst thing that happened to you guys this week? How many of you guys thought you could take on God and you could war against him? That was dumb. In verse 5, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. It's like, you know that he appeared to do this, right? I mean, you know that, right? In him there is no sin. I mean, he reminds the believers of the whole reason why Jesus came. Jesus had to come. He had to become flesh. To take away sin. I mean, if, if there were no sin, it'd be no big deal. If there was no sin, why would Jesus have to come? When Jesus is praying, he, he's, like, he's like, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, please, let's do that. Okay, your will be done. So he had to. There was no other way. Sin is a big deal. In the Garden of Gethsemane, again, just seeing the wrath of God. This is, this is in store for sin. The wrath of God that Jesus wanted to avoid was for sin. Sin is a big deal. It, it, it's, it's completely incompatible with God. Let's, let, let's say that word again. Incompatible. Oh, man. Sin is at war with God. And then he reminds us, Jesus, Jesus didn't have sin. He was sinless. He didn't die because of his own sin. He didn't have a, a sin quality that he had to take care of. He died on behalf of us. The substitutionary atonement, the substitutionary death, the payment for us. Verse 6, no one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. This, is, this could be pretty misleading um, if we don't understand, again, these verse tenses, the verses, it's not saying if you know God, you don't sin. And there's some people, I think, I think we know, all of us know some people who, who might say that. It's not saying that. I mean, he just got done. You know, if we're in trouble, you know, if, if we do sin in chapter 1, and you say, or, or if you say you don't sin, you're a liar. He said that in chapter 1. And then he goes on to say, but we come into the light, our sin is exposed, the roaches are exposed, we, we agree they're roaches and they're wrong. We confess our sin, and He is just and faithful to forgive us of our sin. He just got done saying that, so clearly He's not saying that we stop sinning altogether. As Christians, we're going to fail. We're going to stumble. We're going to sin. So that's obviously not what He's saying. It's been, I think, clear in this text, too, that He believes these people are, are believers. Don't start saying, well, that was maybe they're not believers yet. And that's why he says that they could still sin. He confirmed that, that there were false teachers. But, but in chapter 2, he says, I know you, and I know that you believe, and I know that you have the Holy Spirit. So he's clearly talking to believers. So he's affirming them as that. 
So, so what is he saying? And I think the key to understand this, again, is the durative present. When, when saying, if you sin as a way of life, it's habitual. You go on and on and on as a lifestyle. Then what he's saying in, in verse 6 is, no one who abides in him sins as a way of life. It's not something you just keep doing habitually over and over and over. No one who has seen him or, or who does that has seen him or knows him. So he's pushing back on these false teachers who say that they can live this way, they, they, they can go on and do whatever they want and still be tight with God and still have a relationship with God. He's saying, no, you can't. It doesn't work that way. It's not possible. Verse 7 says, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. So he's not saying that we're righteous because of self-righteousness. He's saying we are righteous because the Father is righteous, and we've been made in his image, or we've been brought and restored into his image. It's because his seed is in us. It's because his nature is in us. It's because his spirit is in us. All these things, because we've been born again, away from the corrupted nature, born anew into his marvelous light. So it's completely born again, and now the Spirit of God is in us. And because of that, because of His righteousness, we are. Verse 8, the one who practices sin, again, the same verb tense, is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy or to set us free from the works of the devil. The best sinner on the face of the planet, the, the devil, has been practicing sin for thousands of years. From the beginning of this cosmic battle, this cosmic rebellion, the general, the chief, the president of the bad guys has been sinning as a way of life. And that's how he lives his life. He's at war with God. And that's the very thing Jesus came to set us free. Verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin, again, as a lifestyle, as a pattern, because God's seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, this goes back to the previous argument. There is no sin in God's, but we, and we've been born of God. If God is our parent, then we have God's nature. We have God's spirit. We have God's seed. We're God's children. And, if we're, and we are in the process of being made like him. Can God be at war with himself? No. So if God is in us, we are not going to be at war with God. We're not going to have a lifestyle that is rebellious against God. It just can't happen. It won't happen. He can't rebel against himself. So, so, so no one who practices sin as, as, a, as a way of life has a seed of God in him or, or her. It's very important. It doesn't say if, if you're born of God, you shouldn't live this way. It just says you can't live this way. Think about that. You can't live this way. It's incompatible. It's not that you shouldn't, or maybe you can for a while, but we hope you come back. No, no, it's just, you can't. And, the, and if you are, something's wrong. Something's in, incredibly wrong. And I think we, it, it, is, it is clear we really need to, to question, were you ever born again? Did you have the seed? Because you can't. You can't rebel against him. You can't go on and on and on. One of, the, one of the dangers, I think, let me, let me try and wrap up. I'm sorry. One, one of the dangers is that we have too much information in our heads. It's true. We, we think we know the answers. And because we, we know the answers, we think we're okay. Or because maybe someone else gives us the right answers, we think they're okay. All we want people to do is, is, is know the right answers and, and say the right things but, but, but maybe they've never experienced God's salvation. Maybe you've never experienced Him. Perhaps you've heard this question. If you were to die tonight and stand before God, what would He say to you? Why would He let you into heaven? Why should He let you into heaven? Has anybody ever heard that question? If you were to die tonight and stand before God, what do you think? Would He let you in or let you out and why? That's a, a diagnostic question. It's, it's been out there for years. I mean, just because you know the right answer, though, doesn't mean you're in. It doesn't mean you're in. 
He, he's not giving us a test. You know, at the, at the pearly gates, Peter, <laughs> is, you know, whatever, making fun of, uh, of some of that. Peter's not there, though, handing us a, a questionnaire. And if we get the answers right, okay, come on in. That's not how it works. But why do we operate that way here? Have you been born again? Really, have you experienced God? Kids, it's not just knowing the right answers. Having the facts in your head doesn't mean you've experienced God's salvation. Because if you can practice sin and rebellion as a way of life, as a habitual pattern, and it doesn't bother you, you have every reason to be concerned. It's truth. If you continue to sin and it doesn't bother you, you have every reason to be concerned. There's a good reason to believe maybe that you don't have God as your father. That's what he's saying. I mean, that, that, that's what John is saying. Verse 10, by this, the children of God and the children of devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Now, when he says it's obvious, it's, it's it's kind of a general statement. It doesn't mean that it's going to be obvious to every single person. I mean, Jesus even said it's hard to tell between the wheat and the tares. You guys remember that? This is something that God has to sort out. It's not that obvious. This is God's business. But generally speaking, people who, who look like the devil are probably and act like the devil or follow in his ways are probably of the devil. And people who, who pursue righteousness are probably belong to, belong to God because he's righteous. So, so what is the text saying? What is it not saying? This is, this is my wrap-up. First of all, let's remind ourselves, guys. John is addressing a very specific problem. The problem is that there are false teachers who have come into the church, who have infiltrated and are spreading just this, this, this lie that it is possible for us to live in grossly immoral lives and still claim to be a Christian. You can't. It doesn't work that way. He's addressing this. He's responding and saying that's impossible. That's whack theology. It's absolutely untrue. And he's concerned that maybe they're being deceived. Maybe it's by the teaching. We look today by social pressure, mounting just popular opinion. And it's hard for us to, to, to say this. It's hard for us to make this stand and say, no, you can't live in, in lifestyles of sin. And, and I'm not talking about any particular sin. I'm talking about any sin. On and on and on. You just can't. You, you won't. Second of all, he's saying that if we are children of God, we, don't, we do not sin. I mean, I, I think he's absolutely not saying that. He's not saying that we don't sin. He's already told us that, that we do, and that's why we confess, and that's why we have an advocate. But if we sin, there, there, there's something deep within us as children of God that responds to that sin. If when you sin, you grieve and you feel bad and you say, I don't want to live this way. And there's conviction and there's a sense that his spirit is in you. And it's saying, again, you don't want to be that way. And you agree with that. I don't want to live this way. I, that's not how I want to be. That's not the, I want to be like my father. If, if, that, if that thought, if that feeling is in you, that's a good sign. You may still mess up, but, but do you regret it? Do you feel bad about it? Is there conviction? Is there something that just makes you miserable when you're sinning? When you sin and that bothers you and that convicts you, I think, again, that's a really good sign. It's evidence of the Spirit of God in you. How many of you guys have that? And you were, you were feeling the heat, but now it's like, oh, thank God, you know? Thank God. His, he has not left you or forsaken you. He is with you, convicting you, bringing you back. I think that's, that's good evidence. But if you can sin as a way of life, or you've got a pattern of it, and it doesn't really bother you, there isn't a lot of conviction, there's not a lot of grief, it's not that big of a deal. It's totally incompatible, guys, with God. And I think that is reason for you to be concerned Maybe you're not born again. Maybe you're not in the family. You've never, maybe you've never truly been born of God. So what, what does all this have to do with community? This is the topic, right? Community. 
and developing Christian community in all of our lives. We need it. It's important. That's what this series has been about. What does this have to do with community? It has everything to do with it. Because sin always isolates. Sin pushes us into the shadows. What's the first thing that Adam and Eve did when, when, after they sinned? They hid. They hid from God. They hid from God, and that's what sin does to us. We hide from God. We withdraw. Now, maybe, you know, our, our, our circumstances, you know, like, like we, we still come to church because I have to. I don't want to be that obvious. But you withdraw. You avoid the real conversation. You avoid the real connection. And you just put the face on. You do what you can to skate by and fool everybody. You are pulling back into the shadows. And God knows. And, and time, time will tell us as well. So I asked you guys at the start of the series, do you experience intimate and passionate love with God? I mean, do you, do you have moments, like I shared the like, highlight of my week, where I was just, I, I couldn't drive. The Lord was just like in my presence, and I was just overwhelmed by it. I was just filled with love and His faithfulness. Do you have moments when you're just and passion with, with God and worship with Him. And do you experience authentic, deep, rich community with other believers? If not, why not? I guarantee you guys, again, if sin is a way of life for you, you have no possible chance of having deep, intimate Christian relationships. You just can't. You won't. You think about the people who, who are in rebellion. You know, they, they gather around rebellion. They, 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 they might develop some kind of pseudo-community, but it's, it's a shell. It's not the community that breathes life into our souls. Do you guys have people pointing you to Jesus, but breathing life into your soul? Asking you the right questions, not accepting the fake answers, pushing you, pressing you, praying for you, encouraging you. Do you have that in your life? Just imagine the possibility. We as the children of God. Can we sing that song? Can you come up? Please, man. I'm not giving you much of a choice. I'm sorry. <laughs> I put you on the spot. Just imagine the possibility that we as the children of God are destined to become so magnificent that no eye has seen nor ear has heard. Just imagine, because we sing this song about being a child of God. Now, understanding what we just studied, how amazing is it that we became, that we are the children of God? That's crazy. By the grace of God. Just imagine if God's children gathered together in the light to dance with Jesus. Just imagine the possibilities for deep, rich, authentic, life-giving community. He says, Behold how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we, what does it say? That we, say it with me, that we should be called children of God. That's amazing. Let's sing about it. In a minute, because I didn't give him much time to prepare.
I want you to go through this week, starting in the conversations that follow after this. Just, I want you to approach things as a child of God. That changes things. So think about that. Meditate on it. And if you're having a hard time really just being amazed by it, get away. Go somewhere. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> get away and, and get to God. And just say, God, I'm not filled with awe. Remind me. Fill me up. Help me be, be filled with this and, 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 again, in awe by it. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you've done. Lord, help us. Confirm in those who need that to be confirmed that they are your children. 
And I ask God that would give them victory and just the, the freedom for whatever they're wrestling with. Let them know they can't do that. They don't have to do that. That there's freedom, that you've rescued them from that. I pray for those who are just on the fence, Lord, and just this is, your, this is the warning. This is, this is the call that they would repent and turn to you and be filled and born anew, filled with you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your mercy. We ask, God, that you would uh, help us. Help us draw near and be there with us. We love you, Jesus. It's all about you. Amen. All right, guys, you're dismissed. Let's encourage one another.